Coming up in our newscast tonight. President Moon Jae-in returns from a brief summer break and gets back to work by ordering his cabinet to make adjustments to the electricity bill system. He also wants more funds injected to projects closely linked to public welfare and job creation. The 2018 ASEAN Regional Forum wraps up with the chairman's statement. In it, participating ministers demand Pyongyang fulfills its commitment to denuclearize and suspend all related activities. The Korea Consumer Association plans to invite owners of BMW vehicles to help them jointly file a lawsuit against the German auto giant. Already 100 participants have gathered to seek experts' help in suing the carmaker after dozens of its products caught fire while on the road. News Center begins now. It's 8 p.m. here in Korea, live from our studio in Seoul. This is Arirang News Center. Welcome to our program. I'm Daniel Che. Let's start things off with Monday's cabinet meeting. President Moon Jae-in ordered the government to focus on helping the people get through the extreme weather and also to relieve concerns over an economic slowdown. To do that, the South Korean leader emphasized the importance of alleviating the burden of heavy electricity bills as well as removing unnecessary regulations. Shin Zemin has our top story. On day one after his week-long holiday, South Korean President Moon Jae-in got down to business, taking on some of the important issues faced by the country. The president ordered the officials to look into adjusting the current progressive rate billing system for electricity. While noting that the country has a safe level of electricity reserves, the president also called for a comprehensive response to the extreme heat, which he likened to a natural disaster. He said as something directly related to the public welfare, the Korean people ought to be able to turn on their air conditioning. Also, to improve the people's livelihoods, the president urged the elimination of unnecessary government regulations, saying that they hamper economic revitalization as well as job growth. <laughs> Then he ordered the government to drastically raise spending on new infrastructure projects like libraries and education facilities, which are closely related to the public welfare and creation of new jobs. Also, on the first day back at the big desk, President Boon named six new presidential secretaries, including some for newly created positions who will be assisting the president on the economy-related affairs. Now, this again raising the importance of the growing public concerns about the slowing economy as well as minimum wage hikes scheduled next year. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. Meanwhile, Seoul's finance chief has been visiting some top local conglomerates. Today, for the first time since becoming the nation's top economic policymaker, Kim Dong-yeon dropped by Samsung Electronics. Our Kim ha sung has the highlights from the session, which includes a meeting with the group's de facto chair. Finance Minister Kim Dong-yeon met with Samsung Group Vice Chairman Lee Jae-yong Monday at the conglomerate's semiconductor plant in Pyeongtaek, south of Seoul. Minister Kim emphasized the role of Samsung in helping create a new growth engine for the Korean economy and in stemming unfair business practices. He said the government will help create an innovative economic platform through investment in areas like AI, big data and shared economy. At the same time, he said improving the corporate governance structure is critical for a leading company like Samsung Group to regain public support and investors' trust. After a tour of the semiconductor production line, Minister Kim and Lee held a closed-door meeting along with various government officials, including the vice minister of the science ministry and heads of several Samsung divisions. 
The finance ministry said the two sides discussed job creation, private public sector cooperation, and deregulation. In particular, Samsung is known to have requested for deregulation in biotech, 5G, and foreign investment and said the company will invest in smart factories and cooperate with subcontractors. Minister Kim said at a press briefing following the meeting that the government will review those areas of regulations. It's the fifth time that the finance minister visited a Korean company to meet with its top management after previously visiting LG Group, Hyundai Motor, SK Group, and Shinsege. Details of Samsung Group's investment plans are expected to be announced in the near future. Kim hye Arirang News. Staying here in the nation, the DSC, a military intelligence unit embroiled in a scandal involving plans to invoke martial law, is now no more. The Defense Ministry followed up the dismantlement with plans to form a task force to prepare a new intel command. Park Ji-won updates us on the progress made thus far. A preparatory task force, according to the Defense Ministry's regular press briefing on Monday, will focus on creating a new military intel command by the first day of September. The preparatory task force team officially kicked off on Monday morning and is made up of 21 members led by Lieutenant General Nam Myung-shin. Nam was appointed to spearhead the reform of the military intel unit last Friday by President Moon Jae-in. The Defense Ministry said the new military intel command will be set up by a new legal framework, which will clearly state the obligation of the intelligence unit's members to stay politically neutral and prohibit the monitoring of civilians. The ministerial ordinances, which will be newly enacted, stipulate the new intel command's missions and organizations, as well as the basic principles of its members' duties, the obligation of staying politically neutral, the prohibition of monitoring civilians and the prohibition of abuses or misuses of its authority. The new ordinances also include clauses that provide grounds for formal objections regarding orders that go against those principles. The new ordinances also create a new post of the Intel Unit's inspection director, which will be taken up by an active prosecutor. A military source told Arirang News Monday that although the newly created command will continue to assume the fundamental roles of the previous military intel unit, such as anti-espionage activities and military security issues, the newly created intel command will have more detailed frameworks that will prevent deviation from its original role. The military intel command came under fire as a series of confidential dossiers drawn up early last year aiming at illegally interfering into domestic politics were released to the public. Park ji Arirang News. Over the weekend, the ASEAN Regional Forum wrapped up. The event brought together the top diplomats of the two Koreas, Washington and Beijing. Participating foreign ministers agreed on a statement calling on the regime to follow through on the promises made during the historic summit with the United States. Park Hee-jun tells us more. The foreign ministers at the ASEAN Regional Forum have jointly called for North Korea's complete denuclearization. The chairman's statement released early Monday demands that the North fulfills its commitment to complete denuclearization as promised and suspends all nuclear and missile tests. The statement also welcomes the outcomes of the two inter-Korean summits and the North Korea-U.S. summits held this year. It urges all relevant parties to cooperate in fully implementing the April 27 Panmunjom Declaration and the June 12 Sentosa Agreement to realize lasting peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula. South Korea's foreign minister, Kang kyung said the meetings were a good chance to reaffirm the shared goal of complete denuclearization and lasting peace in the region. She told reporters on Sunday that although Pyongyang's foreign minister, Ri Yong-ho, rejected bilateral meetings with Seoul, Kang said the two held sincere discussions during their brief encounter at the gala dinner. We exchanged brief but honest views about developments on the peninsula and the ways to cooperate, and I think it's helped lay the groundwork for the Panmunjom Declaration to be carried out. According to the Washington Post, Ryongo also had a friendly conversation with U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo on the sidelines of the meetings, in which they promised to talk again soon. Also, with a letter written by U.S. President Donald Trump for North Korean leader Kim Jong-un having been delivered, there are prospects for productive discussions in the future. Park Hee-jun, Arirang News. 
Keeping our sights fixed on the ARF in Singapore, as it was the only multilateral forum the Hermit Kingdom joins in, some were optimistic the event could enable deeper denuclearization discussions between Pyongyang and Washington. Unfortunately, according to our Oh jung the two sides showed up at the venue only with contrasting views on sanctions. Expectations were high at the ASEAN Regional Forum, with the foreign ministers of South Korea, North Korea, the U.S. and China all present. It was hoped the forum could provide momentum in the struggling North Korea-U.S. denuclearization talks. But the annual regional forum ended with no foreign ministerial meetings at all between the two Koreas, nor between North Korea and the U.S. The tug of war continued between Pyongyang and Washington, with clashing views on sanctions. Making a statement at the forum, North Korean Foreign Minister Ri Yong-ho stressed that Pyongyang has already taken some goodwill steps, halting nuclear missile tests and dismantling its main nuclear test site, pointing out that Washington is not responding to such actions and is still holding on to sanctions, he said. Both sides will have to work things out simultaneously. Meanwhile, speaking to the reporters separately, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo emphasized the need to strictly enforce all sanctions against North Korea, mentioning recent reports about illegal ship-to-ship -ship petroleum transfers. Over the weekend, the U.S. also slapped new sanctions on North Korean and Russian entities, saying sanctions will remain in place until North Korea's final denuclearization. Reports have been pouring out from Pyongyang for several days in a row, all urging Washington to take actions in return for the North's efforts, namely lifting sanctions. Pyongyang's state-run newspaper Rorong Shinmun claimed on Monday that the UN resolutions should have disappeared already as Pyongyang has taken some practical steps, saying that the most important thing now is to build confidence with one another. It urged the U.S. to abandon sanctions and pressure. While Washington is firm in keeping its economic pressure on Pyongyang, especially with its joint military drills with South Korea suspended, how North Korea and the U.S. find a middle ground remains to be seen. Oh jung Arirang News. Seoul and Beijing's new convoys met to discuss denuclearization and ways to establish lasting peace on the peninsula. Lee Do-hun, representative for Korean Peninsula Peace and Security Affairs, and his Chinese counterpart Gong Shen Yu reaffirmed their goal of Pyongyang's complete denuclearization and permanent peace, as promised by the regime during the summit with the South and the U.S. And he emphasized the important role China plays in achieving that goal, calling for concrete efforts on Beijing's part. The officials also agreed to step up cooperation and communication in light of the developments on the peninsula. Separately, in a press interview, Seoul's representative mentioned that other pending issues were brought up too, including formally ending the Korean War, adding that the two countries' views overlap considerably when it comes to North Korea issues. The talks follow last week's meeting between the top diplomats of both sides. South Korea is looking into nine possible cases of local firms importing North Korean coal after reports that it was brought in via Russia last October. If found to be true, that would be a clear violation of U.N. sanctions. According to an official from the Korea Customs Service, the investigation is in its final stage, but there are delays because the suspects are refusing to answer questions and it's hard to determine the true origin of coal imported as a product from Russia. The official added that search warrants are being issued and trade records are being analyzed to see whether the shipment is in fact from North Korea. A diplomatic source also reiterated South Korea is faithfully implementing the sanctions and that Washington has not raised any concerns about the matter. Top diplomats of South Korea and the European Union exchanged views on ways to boost bilateral cooperation as well as recent developments on the peninsula. Meeting with Foreign Affairs Chief Federica Mogherini, Seoul's FM raised concerns about the EU's recent safeguard measures on steel imports as they could negatively impact trade and asked that Seoul be exempt. The two sides also shared their assessments of recent developments in inter-Korean relations, agreeing to cooperate closely to continue the momentum for denuclearization. Kang kyung hwa said she appreciated the EU's policy of critical engagement, that is, imposing sanctions, but at the same time trying to get the regime to come to the negotiating table. She called for continued support in helping to achieve the complete denuclearization of the peninsula and establish permanent peace. The governor of Gyeongsangnam-do province claims to have no connection with an influential blogger who manipulated online political comments in the lead-up to last year's presidential election. 
Kim Jong-soo, a close confidant of President Moon Jae-in, is suspected to be an accomplice of the blogger nicknamed Drew King as he appeared for questioning by special prosecutors at their office in Gangnam. Reporters bombarded him with questions as well. Is he a co-conspirator? Did he attend a session where Drew King demonstrated a common rigging software called the King Crab in 2016? Could it be true that Kim received regular briefings thereafter on the blogger's online activities? Did he request Drew King's help for the local elections? The former lawmaker denied all allegations. BMW Korea has been under a lot of heat as cases of their vehicle catching fire continue to pile up. A long overdue public apology is issued. The company's chair also stressed that it's doing everything possible to relieve consumers' anxiety and explain the cause of the series of auto blazes. Che Xiong has more from the unscheduled presser. At a press conference on Monday, the chairman of BMW Korea publicly apologized for the recent series of car fires. The fires prompted losses and the recall of more than 100,000 vehicles. The vice chief of quality control at BMW headquarters in Germany, who flew to Korea and joined the conference, reiterated that the cause was a faulty engine part, known as EGR or exhaust gas recirculation. In addition to the apology, BMW Korea emphasized that the company is doing everything it can to relieve the anxiety of consumers and promised a successful recall. It was thought by some that the software that runs the EGR might be different in Korea, and that could be the problem. But BMW said it's only different in the United States. It also said the part cannot cause a fire when the car is idling or parked, only when it's being driven. The press conference left some questions unanswered, most notably why a disproportionate number of fires have happened in Korea when the same EGR is used in cars sold in other countries. BMW Korea said the number of diesel cars sold varies country by country, and Korea is number one in diesel car sales. Consumers suspect BMW of hiding the extent of the problem with the part and of trying to avoid a recall. Choi Xiong, Arirang News. Washington is set to reimpose sanctions on Tehran after withdrawing from the 2015 nuclear accord. The measures will not only limit the trade of Iranian automobiles and metals, it can severely affect Korea's crude imports from the Middle Eastern country, meaning gasoline price hikes. Kim ji explains further. The first round of the U.S. sanctions goes into effect on Tuesday, following Washington's decision to withdraw from the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, also known as the Iranian nuclear deal. The sanctions will cover Iranian trade in automobiles and metals, including gold. But even before the sanctions are fully imposed, Korea's outbound shipments to Iran are declining. The Korea International Trade Association estimates the country's exports to Iran dropped by more than 15 percent during the first half of this year from the same period last year to around 1.7 billion U.S. dollars. What's more worrisome for Korea is the second round of sanctions, which targets Iran's oil, energy and financial industries that's scheduled to come into effect in November. The sanctions are expected to take the form of a secondary boycott that would apply to companies and countries trading with Iran. That means Iranian cruise shipments is to drop by November and could prompt a price hike on local gasoline prices. Iranian crude currently takes up nearly 98 percent of all Iranian imports to Korea and more than 10 percent of all crude shipments imported into Korea. Local gasoline prices rose for the fifth straight week to trade at around $1.40 per liter on average, the highest level so far this year, according to the Korean National Oil Corporation. Already, the amount of Iranian crude imports to Korea dwindled by 18.5 percent during the first half of this year from the same period last year to $3.3 billion. Kim ji Arirang News. Trade wars are good and easy to win, a statement Donald Trump steadfastly stands by. Not only is he insisting everything is going just fine, the commander-in-chief even gave himself a pat on the back, claiming the measures help create jobs and wealth in America. Kim yo sun help us read between the lines. In a series of tweets over the weekend, U.S. President Donald Trump celebrated his administration's tariffs on imports from trade partners, including China. He said on Sunday that the tariffs are working big time, adding that countries need to make products within the U.S. to avoid further taxation. The remark can be interpreted as his willingness to continue pressuring Beijing, which has fired back at Washington by imposing retaliatory tariffs on U.S. imports worth some 60 billion U.S. dollars. 
A day earlier, President Trump also tweeted that tariffs have had a tremendously positive effect on America's steel industry, adding it has led to more jobs and wealth. As the trade war between the world's two largest economies rages on, the Wall Street Journal reports that such tensions have put South Korea's Samsung Electronics in a, quote, uncomfortable spot. It explains that Samsung is trying to navigate through the trade war between the two countries as they are among the company's biggest markets, accounting for nearly 40 percent of its revenue last year. And at the same time, the report says Samsung has also been facing tariffs within the American market, including a whopping 50 percent duty on its washing machines. Despite such challenges, the article quoted industry analysts who say Samsung does have some protection, explaining how many companies are heavily dependent on Samsung's components for their own products. Kim Yo-sun, Arirang News. South Korea posthumously recognized 202 women as patriots who fought for the country's independence from Japanese imperial rule. This is a result of a four-month-long government-funded research by the Korea History Cultural Center. 26 of the women have been added to the list of people to be honored next week. Most of the women were involved in independence activism here in home soil, while many others work for the country's liberation abroad. Currently, women make up just 2 percent of the 14,830 activists whose efforts have been recognized by the government. The group says more female patriots should be recognized as the independence movement would not have been possible without their support. Over in Indonesia, a devastating natural disaster took lives during the weekend. As of now, the death toll from the powerful earthquake in the island of Lombok has gone past 142. Attempts to evacuate tourists and locals are currently underway. Cho Sang-min has the latest. Local authorities said Monday that the official death toll from Sunday's massive earthquake in Indonesia has climbed to at least 142, and more than 200 people were injured. According to the U.S. Geological Survey, the quake measured magnitude 6.9. Indonesia's National Disaster Mitigation Agency said it expects the death count to rise. Since the quake, there have been more than 120 aftershocks, some of them felt some 100 kilometers away in Bali. Lombok has suffered two earthquakes now in as many weeks. On July 29th, there was a 6.4 magnitude quake that left at least 17 people dead. Officials said an operation is currently underway to evacuate thousands of tourists from Lombok and nearby islands. More than 20,000 locals have also fled their homes to find shelter, and the Indonesian military has sent humanitarian aid to help with the evacuation. Authorities carrying out search and rescue operations said they are having a hard time locating some people and treating the injured since most of the island's medical resources have been damaged. Cho Sung-min, Arirang News. Time to turn to Michelle back at the Weather Center for the update you need. Michelle, we finally saw some minor changes in the forecast over the weekend and today. That's right, Daniel. And after days of scorching conditions, easterly winds created some rainstorms over the eastern coastal regions, and leading to a massive precipitation. And meanwhile, the rest of the mainland received some sporadic showers caused by the instability in the atmosphere. And the on and off showers will be back tomorrow during the day, with some precipitation expected to be about 5 and 50 millimeters, depending on the regions. Now, but the showers are not going to cut back the readings on the mercury tomorrow. On the contrary, it will be about 3 to 6 degrees higher than the seasonal average topped with some high humidity levels. And over in the neighboring countries, Beijing and Tokyo will stay cooler with some rain. The nation starts again with some uncomfortable readings for at 28 degrees Celsius, Taegu and Gyeongju at 25 degrees. By the afternoon, Seoul is expected to reach up to 35 degrees Celsius, Gwangju at 36, and somewhat cooler in Busan at hitting 32 degrees. The hot conditions will continue to grip the nation this week, and with some daily high steady at 35 degrees Celsius for Seoul, followed by some tropical nights. I'll leave you with the weather conditions around the world.
That's all we have for you in tonight's edition of Arirang News Center. Wherever you may be tuning in from, thanks for staying with us.